or 2.8 photography part four. So there's a difference here between photo collage and photo montage. Sometimes you do hear these interchanged, um, but our book's making a really clear distinction and trying to get you to understand the difference. So a, a photo collage, just think collage, very similar to the Wangechi Mudu piece where you'd cut up a bunch of images and paste them together. A photo mon montage is meant to look like a whole image. And we're going to look at some examples here. But fragments of a separate materials, um, photo-based and pre-printed, are glued together. That is a collage. And then uh, photo montage are meant to be reproduced. And that's a little bit blurry, but let's get into this idea. So remember I said right from the beginning of photography, here we are at 1857, beginning of photography, um, we're thinking of making a painting or a dramatic scene like a play. Um, that is true. So what, what this is is a montage, meaning a bunch of images at once, French word. French, the French words really travel throughout art history, and there's some other words from other origins, but the French have quite a number of them. Okay, so there's a bunch of different photos in this uh, image. So this is one piece of photo paper, pretty big, good size, 16 inches tall by 31 inches across. That's a pretty good size photo. It's like the size of a poster. And our Swedish pho uh, photographer, Oscar Gustav Rejlander, he um, did this time-consuming uh, process, and he took 30 separate negatives, okay? So say I have a negative of this guy in the middle, and I have a negative of this group over here, and I have a negative of her. I'm going to expose each one on the piece of paper very carefully and block out the rest of the paper and then move move across or however he wanted to do it. I don't exactly know top to bottom, side to side, something like that. And he's composing all these images. So he took all these people, these photographs of these people, maybe not in this backdrop at all. The backdrop might have been totally separate. Some people might have been part of the backdrop. If you think back to that cartoon that we looked at of that uh, fresco way back, um, parts are parts are done in the background first, and then you get into the foreground, if that makes sense. So he layered a lot of this stuff and cut around, but he took a long time to do it. Some artists, uh, some photo artists, still kind of do this thing today. Um, and even when we think about photoshopping, you know, putting a different head on a different body or something like that, that kind of thing happens. But that wasn't really his his thought. His idea was two ways of life, sort of a religious painting here. And um, he combined all these images to make one image. Now he's printing it on a negative, and perhaps he's going to um, copy this again and distribute multiples of this. He might re-photograph it with all of the images layered in and then print that photograph but this was made up of separate images I don't exactly know why but that is how he did it so he's emulating the appearance of process of painting he's wanting to get that same respect if that makes sense so he cut them out like puzzle pieces and exposed them onto the piece of paper one at a time uh, we didn't look at Oh, we are going to look at okay we skipped all right um, Loretta Lux, now these are slightly disturbing, and part of the reason is she's playing with scale and proportion here. She is digitally altering her images, and she does it really slowly and carefully. She simplifies her compositions. There's usually not a ton of stuff going on, but in this case, we just have this very formal looking, uh, I don't know if that's Louis the Fourteenth or Louis the Sixteenth, but it's a very... Uh, fussy French provincial look, or it's not provincial, but a French um, uh, piece here, furniture piece, and she's sitting here very formally in her little dress, kind of almost uniform-like, with her hair pulled back, very serious face. The kitten's a wee, a wee bit playful. But what, what Loretta Lux tends to do, and you will see these photographs, because she's a working artist now, this is 2006, and I come across her quite frequently. Um, the Riverside Museum of Art tends to show her work, I believe, because it focuses on photography, but you'll see this in any major museum. So she's taken the head and made it slightly larger to make her doll-like, and I don't know exactly what other changes that she's made, but um, 
she alters it to sort of make a more disturbing look to it. Um, she's trying to get you to sort of think about the, the uh, emotion or the otherworldliness of it. So I find these really disturbing. I always kind of react strangely to these. Um, but it, it's, it, that's her point. That's what she's trying to do is make you kind of think about this. It's almost surrealist. If, if you understand that, like it's a little bit connecting this larger head with this smaller body. She takes these kids, her friends, kids, and sort of, you know, stages this. So this is highly staged and it's digitally altered. Okay. Hannah Hawk, a uh, German artist. So we get into this piece. This is uh, often a, an essay question. I didn't do it this time, but um, this is an amazing piece uh, that was done in 1919, just after World War I. But the seeds of World War II are already being sown, and she's commenting on it here. It's a little bit confusing here. But this is cut up into quadrants, and if you watch the Khan um, video, K-A, HN um, Academy video on this. It's, I, I think they do a great job. So what she's doing is called Dadaism, and we'll get more into this uh, quite soon, but she's one of the early Dadaists. And what Dadaism is, is to be nonsensical, so she's using collage to make this sort of um, bunch of different things happening that don't make sense, and then she's putting Dada in there. Um, I don't know if she cut that word off of something, but Dadaism was already sort of around and getting published in newspapers, so then she's cutting that out. This is pretty much all cut from newspapers, so a few things are happening here. Picasso already does collage a few years earlier, taking pieces of newspaper like Gillette ads or other advertisements and pasting them into his paintings and so now we're going a little step further there's more photography all the time in newspapers and there's more newspapers all the time uh, being printed kind of rapidly because it was the only news medium at this time so uh, they'd print like two or three editions a day and then you'd have this stack of newspapers so it was ready material to be cut up in her case she's using those materials to make a political comment on what is happening at the time so back to our, we'll start with the Industrial Revolution, like the gears and all this machinery going on here, ball bearings and this little thing, ball bearings here. So the machinery is commenting on two things, the Industrial Revolution and the noise and the chaos of the city. And it's also commenting on the mechanization, mechaniz, me, mechanization sorry, of warfare, which you can kind of see here. Um, it, this is a little bit small, but the mechanization of warfare, which just happened, in World War I was so disturbing, um, the wholesale slaughter, the, the, the numbers of death uh, were, were much higher because of this mechanization. And if you go back to the Civil War, you know, 40, 50 years earlier, that is also true where the style of engagement of troops, people, the, the soldiers, doesn't match the ability of the machinery, meaning the guns or the um, heavy artillery or the gas or the aerial bombing. Those things, Civil War doesn't have aerial bombing, don't get confused. This is the beginning of aerial, aerial bombing, World War I. Those things don't match with how people are trying to defend themselves. So the casualties, the numbers of death uh, of, of the, the war dead are astronomically high, something like uh, 8 million people. I believe it's more than that. But a huge number of the population was uh, killed, mostly young men, and um, World War One, sort of the reaction to World War One with a lot of artists was this um, commentary on cruelty and showing all this dis disjointed imagery. Cubism is one of those. It has to do with Einstein, but it also has to do with the disjointed reality these people are living at this time. Okay, 100 years old, uh, way back, the social changes, the norms of noise levels and um, mechanized death, you know, in the warfare, those are all things she's commenting on. Now up here are the anti, you can see big letters, de anti dada are here, and there are a variety of names and faces here um, the Kaiser and some of these other people who um, 
we are looking at towards um, the Weimar, the end of the Weimar um, cultural el epoch. Right after this, Hitler starts to get into power. Okay, down here we have some Dadaists, and we have different faces and, and uh, different people related to Dadaism up here. Uh, we have, oh, oh yeah, Stalin, and there's, um, I think that's a young Einstein. So there's a variety of comments here, machinery, uh, speeches, just the, the chaos and um, disjointed nature of what is happening at that time. So she's pro protesting all these conditions after World War I. So it's a nonsensical combination they flipped the dictionary and they pointed and that's how they got Dada and then you can Google the YouTube videos. I'm just gonna let you be surprised. It's pretty interesting Okay, so postmodern return to historic processes We got into we get into digital a fair bit, which we don't get too far into in this book, but um, some Schools in particular, but some artists as well have decided to go back to darkroom photography and get away from digital or at least explore it. So they're adopting some of these earlier styles and we're going to look at a couple uh, examples. Now this is an actual um, image from 1855, Valley of the Shadow of Death. This is uh, from the war in Crimea uh, in Eastern Europe and <clears throat> at that time. So uh, we're not sure of the, the veracity, meaning the truthfulness of these cannonballs. We think they may have been put there later uh, to make a good photograph and to show that there's just nothing left. Um, don't know for sure on this, um, but what we were looking at is um, salted paper prints from a paper negative. So that's one technique we we're looking at. This is Sally Mann working today, and I believe she's still using this very same technique. <clears throat> and it's a wet process where you can kind of see the wateriness of the imagery. The trees look pretty um, uh, stable, but a lot of the sky is watery, and she really loves this technique. Uh, it's called colloidian process, and it's a wet plate. So um, you can look at an Art 21 of her doing this process. But she has to set up a white, a wet glass plate with certain chemicals on it to get a good image um, while she's working. This particular one is at Fredericksburg, and so she's commemorating a uh, Civil War battlefield, and she wanted to take it with this uh, method that was contemporary to the time of the Civil War, the Colloidian wet process. And she got commissioned to do this. So, um, 